you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to The Times and the Sunday Times Cheltenham Literature Festival, and in particular to this event. My name is Julia Wheeler, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome back to the Cheltenham stage, and indeed back to these shores, a master storyteller. Bernard Cornwell began writing novels almost by accident and has developed into one of our most loved historical fiction writers. He's written about the American Civil War, Arthur's Britain, and the Hundred Years' War. But he's perhaps most renowned for his stories about rifleman Richard Sharp, set in the Peninsula Wars, and of course, the Last Kingdom series. War of the Wolf is the 11th book in that series, and it takes us back more than 1,000 years to be slap bang in the middle of struggles between Saxon and Viking, Christian and Pagan, amid the landscapes of Northumberland, Mercia and Wessex. A question hangs over the head of Uhtred of Bevenberg. Is he the hero that England needs? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bernard Cornwell. Bernard, welcome. Thank you. Set the scene for us with this 11th novel. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I suppose that the, what, what this, the novels are about is the making of England. And I mean, I guess like most people in this room, I was educated in England, like you, Julia. And I mean, before 1066, all you know is that, that King Alfred was a very bad baker. Um, Knut couldn't turn back the tide, maybe Veni Vidi Vici. And, and that's about it. And nobody ever taught me how England was actually came to exist. You know, they sing there'll always be in England, and the assumption is there always was. Well, it wasn't. If you'd been born, say, in the year of King Alfred's death, 899, you would have said you're a West Saxon or a Mercian or an East Anglian or a Northumbrian. You would never, ever have said that, that you were a native of England. And yet, 40 years later, you were. So it's that story. And we're getting towards the end, because Uhtred is now <laughs> getting old. He's, he's not quite as old as me, but he's <laughs> getting there. Um, and so we're getting towards 937, which is the... Really, the, you, can, you can pin that year and say that's the birth date of England. Um, and we're set in Northumbria, which is his country. And Northumbria is under assault by, by Norsemen from across the Irish Sea. So that's the background to it. Mm. And, uh, I mean, you know, naturally, Uhtred behaves badly and with any luck meets a bishop he can insult. Um, he's never happy unless he's insulting a churchman. But there he goes, you know, he's not but perfect. You, so you've been writing about him since he was a much younger, perhaps more intolerant, more violent character. When you... Oh, I don't think he's any less violent. <laughs> well, okay, perhaps less impetuous then, shall we say. Less impetuous. Is he wiser now? Yes, he's wiser. I mean, I should hope so, because um, he suffers like me from a disease called TMB. Tell us. Too many birth dates. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I hope we're all wiser as we get older. Uh, but he's still capable of sort of horrific levels of violence, although, although of course, in, in his mind, they are, are justified. I mean, the creation of England was not a peaceful process. Uh, it, it, was, it was an extraordinarily violent process, and, and, and England was born in warfare. And, and the actual moment of birth, the Battle of Brunenburg, was, was famous throughout Europe for hundreds of years for the, for the dreadful slaughter there. And the curious thing is we've all forgotten about it. I mean, if you think about great battles of Britain's past, you know, you've got Agincourt, Cressy, I mean, I don't know, Trafalgar and Waterloo and so on. Um, and we've completely forgotten this, this battle that, that shocked Europe because of the level of slaughter. Why do you think it is that we are drawn to or have had our attention drawn to 1066 rather than before? I suppose 1066 was a terrible shock. <laughs> you know, it's the one time the French have won an away game. Um, <laughs> and, and of course it wasn't even the French, they were Normans who were quite different. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe there's just too much history. And, you know, that's a nice, easy beginning. Mm. And, I mean, you know, we don't have to learn the regnal dates of all those Anglo-Saxon kings. So I, I think it's as simple as that. that, that, that some, and, of course, the first people who wrote the histories of, of, of England were probably Norman French. And 
as far as they're concerned, anything that happened before 1066 is irrelevant. And so the victors write the history. So the victors go the spoils. And a couple of nights ago, we were in Winchester Cathedral, and um, above the choir, there are these wonderful painted chests. And in those chests are the jumbled bones of the West Saxon monarchs. Uh, because William the Conqueror pulled down the old minster because he feared it would be a place of pilgrimage and built the glorious new cathedral. And, of course, the bones were just tossed into these chests, all except for Alfred. And no one's quite sure where he is, but he's probably like Richard III under a car park. Will we ever know? One day, yes. I mean, one day they're going to repair the car park. And <laughs> so... <laughs> Do you think, though, that those different kingdoms of Mercia and Northumbria and Wessex, when you come back here, do you think that the people of those different regions still have particular characteristics that you've written about in your novels? Well, I think you can probably trace it. I mean, it, it, you know, there's now a Mercian regiment. I mean, certainly Northumberland is different. Um, you know, it's the north versus south. East Anglia was, and this really has nothing to do with the Saxons, was always a much more... Um, Puritan place. I mean, uh, I, I now live in New England, and in Massachusetts, you can't walk 100 yards without coming across a town or a village which is named for somewhere in Norfolk, Essex, or somewhere like that. We've got a brain tree, we've got um, oh, so many names, uh, and which is straight out of East Anglia. Uh, and meanwhile, because the Royalists and the Episcopalians and the Catholics all went south. So now I'm talking about regional differences in America, which is actually not your question. <laughs> but it's the answer that's, you're getting. Yes, okay, that's fine. Is Braintree in America similar to Braintree in Essex? I have a clue. A I've nicer. never been there. Okay. Right. Well, There's a Billericay, too. And is I there? grew up there. I mean, I hope the Billericay in Massachusetts is nicer than the one in Essex. Wouldn't be difficult. But. <laughs> So Saxons and Vikings, you're not the first person to have written about them. And we have in our minds, I think, stereotypes um, about the, you know, the, the Vikings with the horns and so on. How have you gone about not adhering to those stereotypes? Well, it's kind of you to imply that I didn't. Um, they didn't have horns. I mean, they were not that daft. You know, you go into battle with two enormous horns on, I and mean, all you've got to do is knock the helmet off, you know, and suddenly life becomes a lot easier. Um, well, I suppose the biggest difference is in religion. And as far as, I mean, the, the, the desire to make one country out of all the English-speaking people, which is how he put it, was King Alfred's. And that meant battling against the De first the Danes and, and later on the Norse. And both Danes and Norse. But if they converted, they were no longer the enemy. And we do have many, many cases where a Danish leader would convert to Christianity, and immediately, as far as Alfred is concerned, they're one of us now. Uh, so, I mean, there is this sort of image of Vikings, which is mostly the creation, I'm told, of 19th century opera designers. You know, that's the horns. And, and, they had a but they, surplus of horns at yeah, some point. Yeah, okay. they, they definitely did. Yeah, I mean, it looks good on stage. Yeah. And, I mean, there's no doubt that they were very much feared. I mean, there's a, two or three uh, contemporary documents, and there's a famous one from Ireland where the monk is copying out a psalm, and he writes in the margin, from the fury of the Northmen, good Lord, deliver us. And another one where a, a copyist is, again, copying out something, I can't remember what now. And in the margin he writes, um, the weather is very bad. You know, there was very windy, stormy. And this is good because it means the Vikings can't come. Mm. So they were very much feared. And it's very much up to, Alf uh, to, to Alfred's credit that the Saxons managed to organize themselves to fight back. I mean, certainly by the end of that process, um, a lot of the fear of the Vikings had gone because they'd been gaining victory. I mean, slowly, I mean, the, the business of creating England, and of course the people in the north hate to hear this, it starts in the south and works its way up. Mm -hmm. And the, the very specific thing about Uhtred is that he has both of those heritages, if you like, in his character. Now, when you first sat down and thought, I'm going to write a new series, if it, indeed if it was a series rather than a single book, how much um, 
sort of character building did you do before you put pen to paper? Well, I rarely do any, anything like that. Um, it sort of emerge. How? I don't know. If I knew how, I'd teach creative writing. Um, <laughs> I don't know how. I mean, okay, it starts like this. Um, when I was 50, I, I'd, I'd always been fascinated by the Anglo-Saxons from, from way, way back. And I wanted to, to write a series of books that told the story of the creation of England. But, you know, that's okay. I mean, almost all historical novels have a big story. I mean, who will win the Civil War? And then a little story can Scarlet save Tara. And the trick is to flip them. So you put the little story in front and the big story at the back. And so I had the big story, but the big story by itself is not a novel. Um, you've got to have characters, you've got to have people. And then when I was 58, I met my real father for the very first time. It was very careless of me, I managed to lose him. And um, his surname was Outred, O-U-G-H-T-R-E-D, which is pretty close to Outred. Mm. And he was living in British Columbia, um, and I mean, the reason I'm here is he came with the Royal Canadian Air Force to Britain during the war and got lonely one night. Um, happens. And he showed me the family tree. And the family tree went all the way back to the seventh century, to Ida the flame bearer. And Ida the flame bearer claimed descent from Odin, so be careful. <laughs> good, yeah, um, good and it all checked out. I mean, I, I uh, later showed it to the uh, genealogist at Bamborough Castle, and he said, yeah, that's all. They're all. Mm -hmm. So I suddenly realized that I had an ancestor called Uhtred, who was the lord of Bamborough, or they called it Bebenburg. Mm -hmm. And they're Saxons, and almost certainly Christians. And, and I thought, that's my story. Because how did my family cling on to this fortress and their land when the whole of Northumbria was ruled by the Danes and indeed everything down to the Thames was ruled by the Danes and yet they did um, and you know they probably cooperated and um, but that was you know I'm making up the story as I go along so I, I knew that 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 Uhtred was a Saxon I knew that he lived among Danes or certainly that his um, his land was and I, I, I actually don't know quite why. I mean, it, it happens very early in the first book that he's captured by Ragnar. I don't never know what's going to happen in a book when I write it, ever. I can't plan books. I mean, I'm, I'm writing the 12th one now. And, you know, I'm basically, I'm in chapter three and Uhtred's dead. Yeah, I've written him into a corner and there is no escape. Uh, and that's bad, you know, because... <laughs> It'll be a very short book and no one will read it. <laughs> so what you do is you go back, right? And, and so I'm get, well, as soon as I get home next week, I mean, I, I'm going to go back to the end of chapter one. And instead of making this choice, he'll make that choice. And that'll keep him alive as far as chapter six, I'm guessing. <laughs> so, so you need to seed things in. But yeah. because you don't plot, it's a retrospective seeding. I spend a lot of time doing what I call putting doors in alleys. And by which I mean, you know, that in chapter 10, Sharp finds himself in an absolutely blind alley. I mean, 30-foot high walls on three sides of him. And on the fourth side, he's got 20 Frenchmen with leveled muskets. And Sharp's rifle is empty and his sword is broken. And the Frenchman says, aha, Monsieur Sharp, we have got you now. You are dead. And it's true, he is. So at that point, you put a door in the alley so he can go through now, if I did that, the reader would feel incredibly cheated, mm. right? So what you do is you go back to chapter two, set a scene in that alley in which the door is important. Mm. So, it's so the, the reader knows the door is there. In fact, I have cheated because I've gone back to chapter two and invented it, but I, you can't invent it in chapter 12. So and, yeah, and the, no the, one will ever know. Shh. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's, it's a little bit like that, you know, if we've, got a, if we've got a gun in Act 1, it really needs to go off by Act 3. Chekhov's great dictum, yeah. yes. If the curtain goes up and there's a rifle hanging over the mantle, yeah. someone's going to get shot. Mm. Mm. Okay. So um, 
Did you feel then that there was a certain element of your own destiny in writing this story? <laughs> I'm not creating a country, Julia. Well, no, but, because, <laughs> no, but, but by, you know, by going back and tracing your, your biological family back and so on, did that create an extra pressure? I, no pressure. Um, I mean, I, I, I play Mary Hell with the real Uhtred. I mean, he didn't do any of the things I make him do, but that's fair enough. It's a novel. It's not, you know, I'm not writing history. I'm writing a story. And the background, the big story has to be authentic as you can make it. Um, but, but what your characters do, you can make up entirely. No, I think, I mean, I, I, I never noticed this. It was, some, it was somebody wrote into the website and said, you know, Sharp is an outsider because he's up from the ranks and Starbuck in the Civil War books is an outsider because he's fighting for the wrong side. And Uhtred is an outsider because his sympathy is with the Danes. So I guess that's something I unconsciously do. Although I do remember when I wrote Sharp, I deliberately making him, I mean, that, that is one piece of planning I did do before I even started Sharp's Eagle. I knew that Sharp would be out from the ranks. Simply because, I mean, the villains can't be on the other side. I mean, okay, you can have villainous Frenchmen. I mean, maybe all Frenchmen are villainous, but he's not going to spend much time in the company of the French. He's going to spend a lot of time in the British Army, so the villains have to be in the British Army. Mm. So that you've got to give them something about Sharp that they're going to dislike. Mm. And, and then we got complaints after I wrote Sharp's Eagle because there were no birds in the book. Really? People wrote to Harper Collins and said, I bought, I bought this book, Sharp's Eagle, and it was not about <laughs> eagles. Brilliant, brilliant. You, you actually have a lot, it seems like a lot of interaction with your fans. And do you find sometimes that when they write to you at, at the website, they've noticed things that you haven't? There's always a helpful reader. <laughs> So what sort of things do they come up with? Well, it, they, they, they come in two forms. Um, you get nice letters. And I'm, I'm, in one of the Sharp books, I had a sore-backed rifle bayonet. And I, and I got this charming letter from a man who turned out to be the biggest expert in the world on Napoleonic bayonets. And I got it wrong, which is fine, because it actually led to a friendship. Mm. Um, and then you get people who are really angry. You fool. Don't you know there were no snowdrops in Arthur's Britain? How could you be such an idiot? I, no, they really do. They get very hot under the collar. And, and I mean, I, I put snowdrops in the books about Arthur. And evidently, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure this helpful reader was right and they didn't exist. But I never bothered to take them out. They're still there. Mm. And the... the, the, the the funniest, I think, was, when on, was actually writing the Arthur books, because this was before the internet, and so it all came by snail mail. And the letters began arriving pretty soon after the first volume was published, and, and they were all much the same. It was, Dear Mr. Cornwall, I have read um, your novel, The Winter King, and I have to tell you, you've got it all wrong. I was Galahad in a previous existence. Uh, and. Uh, I kept them all, because the, the, and, and I think I got 17 Guinevere's. Um, I don't know how many Lancelot's. Mm. I actually had a sort of wicked thought once that I should write back to them all and assemble them in one place, you know, like this, and say, all right, Galahad's in that corner, Gawain's <laughs> over here, Merlin's here, please, come on, hurry up. <laughs> and they could fight it out. Yeah. I mean, in, in, you know, I mean, it'd be great if it was true, because it would be a wonderful res research resource for me. But. Yeah. Um, Make a great novel as well, wouldn't you? <laughs> I don't know. I think and there was one who wanted me to go and sleep with him in a cave. Can't Liddy, I think it was called. And he says that the ghosts of Arthur's table appear to him in this cave. And not being an adventurous fellow, I never took up the invitation. No. Some invitations are easier to let go than yes, others, I'm sure. Are, yes, I'm sure. Yes. Um, so... In terms of research, then, how much do you, have you found that you've needed to do? And, and now when you're writing um, an ongoing series, is it sort of almost so through you that time that you don't need to go back to original sources and so on? Oh, I still go back. Um, yeah, I mean, research is actually a lifetime thing. I've been reading about the Saxons for well, I don't know, 50 years. So a lot of it is stuck there. Um, 
I do tend to play pretty merry hell with, with the history. I mean, partly because the story runs away with me. And, um, I mean, I decided to use this character, Uhtred. Uh, he didn't live as long as my Uhtred did. And, and as far as I know, he didn't do any of the things I make him do. Uh, but I, I got slightly into trouble um, with Sigtrig, who is the Norse king of Northumbria and did exist. Um, I marry him to Uhtred's daughter. And this has now become a stumbling block. Mm. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a bit of correction going on in the next couple of books to, to get it back on track. I mean, yeah. to, for the real history. Because once you can go back as you're writing each individual book, but once those books are out there, you can't change it, can you? You can't. No, absolutely yeah. not. No, and if you make a real wreck of it, then you know you're, you're stuck with it. I hope I haven't made a real wreck of it. So, how many more books do you think there will be in this series? I'm not sure. I think two or three. I mean, he really is getting old. So am I. Um, this present book that I'm writing is basically about who becomes king of Wessex which really Uhtred shouldn't have a hand in, but, it's too, but the, the true facts are so wonderful mm. that I'm sending him back south to, to kill some people. Um, <laughs> and then, um, well, not to give away spoil, I mean, there, there, somebody takes an oath in this book, which is going to be broken. So I would quite like to tell that story, which again is real history. And then the last one will be the Battle of Brunenberg, where, where Uhtred will be there with, you know, life support. <laughs> but you can... And he'll have, a, he'll have a Zimmer frame, you know, <laughs> onwards, come on, charge! But can you cheat time a little bit? You do all the time. Yeah. You do all the time. I, I, my my, my favourite bit of cheating time uh, is in the Sharp books, because I wrote one series, right, called the Ur series, which got him up to Waterloo. And then um, along came Sean Bean, who only got the part of Sharp because he looked like me. And, um, <laughs> um, and I thought, well, OK, um, if they're doing Sharp series, we should write more Sharp books. So I wrote a second series that I, I like to say is dovetailed together. Well, it isn't. They're hammered together and all sorts of things it says here and don't happen here. And every woman he meets in this second series has to die because she's not mentioned here, mm -hmm. which really upset me because I liked one or two of them very much. <laughs> um, and I say in this series, where you never see Sharp in India, but you know he's be he served in India, that he learned, to, he learned to read while he was in the Tipu Sultan's jail. Well, then finally I come to write the book about him being in the jail, and I realized he was only in the jail for about 10 days. Mm. So I think it's chapter five of Sharp's Tiger. Um, begins with some, some writing about time passing. Mm. It gets all airy-fairy, and I wandered lonely as a cloud and all that stuff. And you get the impression that time is really passing, you know, and Sharp is learning his alphabet and learning to read, and then we go back into a bit more flowery, time is passing stuff, and then we get on with the story and he escapes. It's only been 10 days in there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but where you do have to be accurate is in your non-fiction, and you wrote a non-fiction book um, for the anniversary of Waterloo, for didn't Waterloo, you? Waterloo, yes. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's so difficult writing non-fiction. You know, these terrible things called facts. Mm. <laughs> and you have to get them all in. Um, yeah, it was, it was different because, obviously different. Um, I suppose the biggest job I have is to make the story, mm. is to create the story. And that's when you're always going back and changing things and changing choices that people make. And there's a great sense of relief when you realize that there is a story and, and it's there, and, and then the rewriting is just fun. The nice thing about Waterloo is that it is a magnificent story. Mm. Uh, it's a magnificent story. And so I, there was none of that. It's just a question of, of doing the research. And I put a, a very, very long table in, in that I call it the office, which is a very posh name for the biohazard area where I work. 
And I think when I finished, there were 78 books on the table, all open with post-it notes. Mm. And I only lost one quote in the whole time, which, which upset me, but didn't make it in the book, but never mind. My fault for not posting, post-noting it. Mm. So tell us about the environment in which you do work then, as well as this long table. Where, <laughs> where do you sit and write? Um, well, most of the books are actually written in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, uh, and, and there I was banished to the attic. And so, so I've got tables laid out with... with I, I, I love having an absolutely enormous screen to mm. work on because you can put up two pages at once. And it does develop into the most horrible mess. It's the only way I can work. But I know where everything is. I know where every, you know, what little notes I've scribbled that it's in that dirty pile and not that pile. And bills get lost in it, which is good. That's handy, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. nice. And cups of coffee? Yeah, lots of coffee. Yeah, far too much coffee. And what time of the day, how does your writing day work? I get up early. I, I like to be working by 5.30, 6 o'clock. Um, the dog has to be taken for a walk, sort of seven-ish, mm -hmm. and then work through to lunch, and then the dog wants another walk, and so on through the day. And do those dog, work, dog walks <laughs> help you unravel plot Yes, it does. I mean, the, actually, head? the best thing is to take a shower. All my best ideas come when I'm in a shower. I don't, have no idea why. But yeah, the, I, I, I hate traveling when I'm writing. Because you, you and this doesn't count, because I've only just started the new book. Mm. Um, but by the time you get to chapter five or six, everything is in your head. You know what everybody has said, you know what motivates everybody. Um, when you go to bed at night, you're probably thinking to yourself, you're hearing conversations between the characters, which have got nothing to do with the book itself. I mean, it's just, you're just listening to these characters talking. And when I take the dog for a walk, I, I hear them talking to each other. And it tells me a lot about the character, because um, they could be talking about anything. Um, and then if you go away, if you travel, it, it all <laughs> drains out. Mm. And then when you get home again, you've got to go back to the beginning and, and shove all that stuff back into your brain. And, I mean, it's fun. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. I, I just don't understand people who complain that writing is so hard because nobody forced them to do it. And as far as I know, every single person who is a writer wanted to be a writer. I mean, nobody put a gun to my head and said, you will leave television, you will become a novelist. No, please not. Yeah, come on. Mm. Right? I mean, I wanted to do it. Mm. And... I sit there and I tell stories. I mean, what could be nicer? Mm. And, and um, it's fun. It's, it's real fun, you know. And I think, you know, the joy of reading many, many books is to find out what happened. And the joy of writing a book is the same, is to find out what happened. Because mm. I honestly don't know how this present book will... I don't know how chapter three will end, let alone chapter 14 or whatever it is. Mm. So you worked for the BBC for a long time um, on Nationwide. Anybody remember Nationwide? Yes, me too. Oh, you're as old as I am. <laughs> um, and then uh, we're in Northern Ireland for a while mm -hmm. with some fairly famous names as well, weren't you? Yeah, I had a young man working for me. Uh, he was 21. He showed some promise, called Jeremy Paxman. <laughs> and was he always like... Yeah, he was, he oh God, he hasn't and... changed a bit. Right. No, 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 not, not a bit. Right. Um, and so he was good. He yeah. was very good. Yeah. And so how was it that you did come to write? Because it was slightly by accident, wasn't it? <laughs> it's totally by accident. Well, I was in Northern Ireland. I had another reporter called Gavin Esler, who also did pretty well for himself. And, well, to tell the whole story... Um, the, the government was sent putting out a white paper called Wither Industry in Ulster. You know, and this is deeply, deeply boring, but we have to cover it. It's actually also deeply, deeply important. And so we got this, we were preparing this program on Wither Industry in Ulster. And, and suddenly they delayed publication of the paper. So we was, there was a hole. And I looked at the diary, and I saw that the, the Northern Irish Tourist Board, in its wisdom, 
was bringing a group of American travel agents to Ulster as a tourist destination. And I thought, this is stupid. And in fact, what they were doing, it was spring, it was they were getting rid of their budget or spending as much of their budget as they could so it wouldn't be cut the next year, but I didn't realize that. So they were bringing these poor American travel agents to Ulster, and it was, the, and I hope it stays this way, it was the second worst year of the trouble. Troubles, you know, I mean, there were bombs going off like every other day, and there were sort of shootings. It was, it was, uh, it was a pretty rough place. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is crazy, but there's, a, there's a film in this. So I phoned up the Northern Irish Tourist Board who'd announced it in a press release and said I wanted to film it, and they immediately backed off. But they couldn't say no because they'd obviously sent the invitation. So they said, and I remember the guy to this day saying to me on the phone, oh, you'll not get a film out of it, Bernard. He says they're dumb as two planks, these Americans. Can't put two words together, you'll never get an interview out of them. And he was very, very convincing, so Gavin and I flew to, to Edinburgh to meet them. And I thought, if, if two of them can rub two words together, I'm in with a chance. And this guy was almost right. I mean, I, I mean we're, in, we're in Edinburgh, and one of them said to me, I don't understand why we can't just take a train to Belfast tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, okay, you're a travel agent, not me. <laughs> um, and we were standing in the lobby of the King James V Hotel where they were staying, and the lift doors opened and a blonde walked out and I said to Gavin I'm gonna marry that one trouble was she was already married <laughs> and it took me 18 months um, but you know 40 years on we're still married Congratulations. and Judy had perfectly valid reasons for not being able to live in Britain family reasons and I really didn't have any great ties so I said don't worry I'll move to the States you know I mean just like that and the Americans wouldn't give me a work permit. Um, so I said, don't worry, darling, I'll write a book. And which book was that? That was Sharp's Eagle, the book without eagles. And, um, and I'm still writing, not the same book. <laughs> and we've been married, I know, I think it's 38 years now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was crazy, it was insane. Um, but she's very beautiful. She is, I've met her. She's lovely. She's lovely. <laughs> and I don't regret it. No. But I never thought I'd end up living in America, ever. I mean, I like cricket and decent beer. But does it, does it give you a perspective um, on Britain living there? I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, I, I sometimes <laughs> think Judy and I are very lucky because when we come to Britain, we, we, we tend to go to the nicer places like Cheltenham. Mm. You know, we get a British tourist board view of Britain. And I still love Britain. I mean, I love England. And life has got more bearable in America because now on YouTube you get highlights of the day's cricket every night. Um, no, I watched the whole of the test series this summer. I mean, it's great. Mm. I mean, five years ago, trying to get cricket on any screen in America was virtually impossible. So... And actually, I now, obviously, I love America. I've lived there. I could not, could not possibly live there unless I liked it. Don't like the politicians, but... <clears throat> well, one in particular. We've got some politicians here as well, though. Yeah, I know. It's not yeah. much better, is it? Um, um, so, you and Judy have collaborated on some fiction as if well, If you believe you? that, then you go on believing it. <laughs> Really? Okay, what happened was, is that I have a, a um, and one of my boasts was is that I had the same wife, editor, and agent for 38 years, and very, very sadly, the agent died at Christmas, but um, you get the picture. Mm. And this book is actually dedicated? To Toby, yeah. yes, who was a, who was a, that's another story I better not tell. Um, <laughs> the, I, I have this terrific editor, and I'm very, very lucky to have her, and um, at some point, um, a couple who I call the Macbeths took over HarperCollins and, and my wonderful editor was fired and when, I was immediately picked up by another house and actually that's not, I think it's something like that anyway, I, I think it was the Macbeths who wouldn't, said to me you can't write two books a year, nobody wants to read two books by the same author, so I wrote it under a pseudonym 
And when I was in Belfast, I mean, a group of us were um, in a pub one night. I know that surprises you. Um, <laughs> the IRA put a bomb in the Donegal Passage. They'd parked a petrol tanker there and suspended the bomb. And I mean, you know, it, was it didn't go off. The army defused it, but we were all stuck in a pub for hours while they cleared the city center. It was mm. a tough, tough life in Belfast. And we were having this discussion about, you know, what we all, and we all, we all wanted to write books. And then we decided that the ideal name for an author was Susanna Kells, being Ireland. And then we said, okay, whoever writes the first book under the name Susanna Kells gets a crate of whiskey from everybody else. Well, I won. <laughs> and the thing about Susanna, I couldn't do any, um, publicity for it. Well, I could, but you know. <laughs> I know trans is in fashion now, but it wasn't back then. <laughs> and so I, I put out the pretense that I'd done it with Judy. And it's almost true. I mean, I, I did say to her one day, I've got this sentence, it says, fish and fish and, what do you think the next word is? Chips? Yes, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so she did, you know. Okay. Let's talk about telly. Telly fictional telly rather than yeah. uh, news telly. Um, how much of a difference does it make to your writing now that The Last Kingdom is televised? None. Absolutely none. Well, one... I mean, the wonderful Alexander Drayman, who only got the part because he looks like me, um, <laughs> <laughs> is still playing a very young Uhtred. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my Uhtred is... We've already established that he's no longer young. Um, it actually doesn't make any difference at all, and that's not putting them down, because I love what they do. I absolutely love what they do. Um, and they do change things because they have to change things. And I think they add a huge amount of value to the books. Writing Sharp, Sean Bean did change, but only a very small way, which is that whenever I write Sharp, or when I wrote Sharp, I heard Sean Bean's voice in the Yorkshire accent. No, that's Irish. Um, but I, I could hear Sean Bean. And was that helpful? Yeah, it was amazing. Oh, come on, Sean is wonderful. But then people would write to me and say, it's terrible, Sean Bean has fair hair, and you say Sharp has got black hair. Oh, oh God, you know. I have... Didn't you have to write a prequel to Sharp, which yeah, had lots of Spaniards? Yeah, that was Sharp's battle. Um, I think there was a possibility of Portuguese money, so they wanted a Portuguese hero in it. <laughs> so, so I did. So you did. Yes. And and how much? Um, probably control is the, control is definitely the wrong word. But how much um, collaboration is there between you and the TV people? None. None. Uh, so when do you get to see what they've I'm, done? That's my choice. Okay. In both the Sharp production and uh, Carnival Films, who make. The Last Kingdom asked if I wanted to be an advisor, and I said no. Um, I mean, I worked in television for 11 years, and one thing I know is that I know absolutely nothing about producing television drama. Mm. Um, nothing. And these are the people who made Downton Abbey, you know, which is not... suggests they might know a thing or two, yeah, yes. And any... Any demand I have, anything, is likely to be an obstacle to them. And you don't put obstacles in the way of people who are doing this. Mm. And, I mean, I trust them totally. As I said, they add value. I think they add wonderful value. Mm. And um, I think my job is to be a cheerleader, and, um, which I am, because I love, I love what they do. And, but they've never asked me. I mean, they, they, they did finally, well, I say finally, say, would I like to make a cameo appearance, you know? I mean, you know... Hold that the, thought, because it, funnily enough, Jimmy, in this direction, has got a picture uh, of that. <laughs> <laughs> the hair's my own. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about being on the set. Where was it? What was the, how Well, it was it in work? Hungary. And actually, it was a, it was a spring day. And, and the scene they were shooting had to, to join on with a, a scene they'd shot earlier, and it was snowy, so they'd had to import all these huge snow-making machines. And we're all dressed up in these sort of enormous fur outfits and leather. God, it was hot. Um, it was great fun. 
It was enormous fun. Uh, I mean, I, I look, it's episode seven. You don't have to watch the others. <laughs> but, but if you blink, you'll miss it. I had five words. Wh which were? He's vanished like smoke, gone. I did make a creative contribution, though. Which was? Well, there were five of us, and we're rogues. And we are stalking um, Uhtred, who is with his girlfriend, through the woods. And we think he's vanished like smoke, he's gone. But in fact, they know we're there. And this is sort of a spoiler, but it doesn't matter, because it's not really part of the story. All five of us are doomed to die. Ah. And I'm the first to go. So the director said, he's, 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 you know, we go through this stream. And he said, we've got to find some reason for you to, to stay behind and be on your own. I said, well, I could stop and have a pee. Yes, he said. <laughs> so my television debut is having a pee. <laughs> But it's not the first time that you've, you've trod the boards, is it? I mean, that is something that you do on a fairly regular basis. I do, yes. Whereabouts? Yes. Hmm? Whereabouts? It's in Massachusetts, in a, in a, a very, very small summer stock theatre. Um, certainly about a third of the size of this one. Hmm. Um, and we put on eight plays over the summer, two musicals and six plays, always Shakespeare. Um, and... I mean, I think I originally got asked because they think I got the right voice for Shakespeare, so they immediately cast me in Macbeth. Mm. Um, As Macbeth? No, God, no, no. <laughs> do, do me a favor. I did play Prospero, though. Okay. Yeah. And I had this wonderful, I mean, I had this wonderful wig which came down to here and these robes, and one of, one of the young actors looked at me and said, you look like Jesus if you'd lived to be 70. <laughs> And I guess that, that's quite a contrast from your, from your working life, where it is very solitary compared yeah. to being in a team. Yeah, writing is a solitary vice. And don't feel sorry for anybody. I mean, I say it's solitary, but I spend my day with these characters. I mean, Uhtred is incredibly real to me. Mm. Um, and so are the others. But then you have this delicious period in the summer where you work with a company. And I need, what I should say, is the, the theatre and I think it's the last of its kind in the States, is for talented drama students from all across America, Canada, and the United States, even from Britain sometimes. Um, and they're all, some of them are postgraduates, some of them are undergraduates. And all the directors are equity professionals from New York or London. And usually the grown-up parts are played by equity professionals. Mm. Um, Somehow I got involved. But I, it means I spend the summer with these wonderful kids. They're, they're just terrific. I mean, they're between 18 and 26. And they're irreverent. They're passionate about what they do. They're enormous, enormous fun to be around. And because you, because you rehearse with them, all the barriers break down. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm in my 70s, and suddenly I find myself with these 20-year-olds treating me with a gross <coughs> lack of respect. Probably does you good. Yeah, I imagine it does. <laughs> yes, and, and uh, I confess I absolutely, absolutely love it. It's, mm. um, and I've never acted before. I've never been on stage before, so for me, it's been a, a decade sort of course in acting. Mm. Um, Something to do out of your comfort zone. Way out. Yeah, yeah. and yet each, each year I volunteer to go back. I, you know. Good. Well, long may that last. Right. Let's. Um, Take up the house lights, if we may, and get the microphones out. If you've got a question, do stick up your hand. There's one we'll come to just here. Our volunteers have got microphones, so do just wait for the mic to get you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, is there an autobiographical element in Uhtred, say, in your attitude to the Christian church? No. <laughs> Uhtred's much nicer to them than I am. No, I, I can't, I can't. I'm married to an Episcopalian. Um, good one, too, a good Christian. No, there really isn't. It's, um, I wrote a book called Fools and Mortals, which I rather like. Um, nobody dies and it has fairies in it, so, which is about the first production of um, Midsummer Night's Dream. And, and there is certainly some anger against the Puritans in that. I was brought up in a Puritan family, and um, it's given me ammunition that will last me a lifetime. 
But I don't think so. I mean, it, it's, it's part of this outsider thing. Um, Uhtred at heart is a Saxon, even though he likes the Danes. And obviously the sort of other major character, at least in the first uh, six or seven books, is King Alfred. And Alfred is a passionate, sincere um, Christian. So the one sure way to create tension between Alfred and Uhtred is, is to make Uhtred into a pagan, and that's really the choice. But he does enjoy it. And two of the best jokes are with Uhtred and the bishops, and I'm not going to tell you them. Oh. No, no, one of them is bad. Go on. <laughs> other, other questions? Um, yes, let's come to you first, and then into the middle here with the next one. Thank you. Yeah. Bearing in mind that the Saxons were the uh, most dominant force of what we now call English. Why are we not Saxland rather than Angleland? I agree. Um, and, and all of this goes back, basically. Uh, I mean, what, what Alfred wrote was that he wanted to be king of all the English, Anglisk-speaking peoples. Um, and indeed, you know, it's the Angles mostly, not entirely in the north. As you say, the Saxons. I don't know why we're not. I mean, that was their choice. They chose to do that, and, and they chose Englerland as a name or adopted it as a name. I really don't know. I mean, it's, uh, none of them wrote down why. We're just stuck. You know, it's just one of those curi historical curiosities. Mm -hmm. Then the second question I didn't answer properly. <laughs> no one will know. In the middle there, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if you've been asked this many times before, but I was very curious to know why you stopped writing the Starbuck Chronicles when you did and whether you have any plans to go back to them. Well, I'll answer the second bit is no. Um, unless I live an incredibly long time and run out of other things to write. I'll tell you what happened. It was, I, I began writing those after Sharp's Waterloo. And I really thought, okay, I've, I've written the Sharp series. I think there are 11 books. Um, and then along came Sean Bean, who only got the part, but, but anyway. Um, and, I, and I went back to writing Sharp, because you know, it was a totally venal decision to make more money. Um, and, and poor Starbuck got left behind. And the other thing is, is that when I was writing Starbuck, which I enjoyed, and I, I liked those books, and I actually had another one all sort of done, did the research for it, all that research is still there. Um, when I'd finished a Starbuck book, I'd put all the chapters into one enormous file on the computer and then go to the top of it and use that search and destroy thing you've got on computers and say, find the word sharp and replace it with Starbuck. Because it was so like writing sharp that I would automatically write sharp. And you know, it would go through and change it about 48 <laughs> times. Um, so I didn't want to write Starbuck and Sharp at the same time because it would have just been too confusing. Uh, and I'm sorry, he just got left behind. Um, I, no, I don't think I will. I might. <laughs> All right, it's on the list. Other questions? Yes, we'll go to the back there, and then we'll come to the front here. That would be great. Thank you. Leave it in a second. Yes, um, go ahead. Uh, two, two questions, if I may. One is um, about Charleston. I've been to Charleston a couple of times, and it's such a beautiful place. It is. I wondered if you would ever think about setting a novel there, one of the periods in history that worked. And the second question is actually following on from the Starbuck. I've read some stuff online about an American company trying to make the Starbuck uh, novels into a TV series, and I don't, it don't seems to me that they haven't got very far. I wondered if you had any information about that. No more than you. I, it ain't going to happen. Um, I, you know, I've heard nothing from them for about three years, and I don't ask. Um, so I doubt that's going to happen to be honest. Um, Charleston, yes. And I, I mean, you know, every time I walk the dog, I think, oh, God, I'd love to set a novel here. And it would have to be another Starbucks. Starbucks has got to go to Charleston. Um, and it's, it is a wonderful city. It's a lovely city. 
and um, it's been on the wrong side of every argument for 300 years. Uh, and yet, it's, it's a beautiful place. So I, I th that is a possibility. I mean, and we're coming back to your question. If there'll be another Starbuck, it won't be the novel I was thinking of. It'll be set in, in Charleston. The Charleston, yeah, never mind. Yes. Possibly, yes. <laughs> you heard it here first. Good. Down here. Um, is there any remotest chance that you could hammer another sharp uh, and a Harper into uh, into the series. Oh, great! I think it's um, <laughs> the plan is is to write the twelfth story of Uhtred, and then to do one more sharp, um, and then go back and finish Uhtred's story. And the reason for doing the sharp is that if I, I, I assume you've read them. You're wonderful, I love you. Um, <laughs> is if you remember, he had this horrible man called Charles Morris, who, an officer who treated him peculiarly badly. And we've never taken revenge. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've already written a book called Sharp's Revenge, so that can't be the title. I mean, Morris is in for such a nasty end, it ain't true. <laughs> It'll be slow and drawn out. Um, and, and that, not, I mean, I always know I'm serious about a novel when, when I go to Stanford's in London and buy the huge, large-scale maps of where it takes, and we haven't visited the area it will take place, but we will. Um, but, but yes, I'm not saying that is definitely going to happen because, you know, I might get a better idea, but, but at the moment, that is the plan, is to write this book, which doesn't have a title, then the Sharp book, which doesn't have a title, and then another Utra book called The Broken Oath, and then the final Utra book, which I want to call Slaughter Yard, and my publisher has turned down that title three times, so it'll probably be four. Sounds like you've got a plan. <laughs> well, yeah. For the next few years. <laughs> um, other questions? Yes, at the back, and then we'll come to you in a second. Yeah. Whoever's got the mic. Yeah, go on. Hi there. Um, so a quick question. Utra's old now, but surely he isn't immortal. Um, and on that basis, I was just wondering whether in the future his son, Uhtred, will be playing a bigger role or not? I don't know. <laughs> the answer is I don't know. Because I, because, I mean, I don't care how old he is, he's going to be at the Battle of Brunenburg. And if he's at the Battle of Brunenburg, he's going to do some damage. I mean, he, you know, he can get up off his Zimmer frame long enough to... I mean, he'll be on horseback. And I won't really know until I write that book. But I, I took the slightly fatal choice of writing them in the first person. And I think it would not, it wouldn't be, it really wouldn't work to, to give to his son. And I, I mean, I, if you like the Utrecht books, and I gather lots of you do, and thank you for that, one of the things I think, you, I hope you like, is listening to Utrecht's voice. You know, his comments on what's going on. Um, and I'd be very loath to lose that. I mean, you're just going to have to have a, a slight leap of imagination as this old age pensioner goes to war. But remember, you know, um, Marshal Blucher was, was 74 at the Battle of Waterloo. He got, you know, ridden over by French cavalry at the Battle of Ligny. And um, he was badly bruised. The, the French didn't realize it was him because an aide de camp had the. Uh, was quick-witted enough to throw a cloak over his medals and gold braid. Um, but he recovered and by, by using a liniment of rhubarb and brandy. So trust me, the last Uhtred book will have a smell of rhubarb and brandy about it. But he'll he'll know, survive it. Do we know that rhubarb was around in Britain at that time? In, in... <laughs> I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. Um, there's a question over here. Yes, could we get a microphone there? To keep your hand up and someone will get a microphone to you. Thank you. Um, I'm from Malmesbury. King Athelstan is credited with being the sort of final unifier of England and the first king of a unified England. And he to Malmesbury is what Kenny Dalgleish is to uh, Liverpool. Will he, will he, uh, are you aiming to, to, to getting to Athelstan or are you going to stop just before you oh, get Oh, no, to? I mean, Athelstan's already in the books. Oh, um, you caught me out. Um, no, 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 it's okay. I mean, there are so many Athelstans, Athelwolds, Athelhelms, Athel everybody else. I don't blame you. 
You know, it'd be much easier if I just called them all Fred and Charlie. Um, and he's not a really major character, so, so no, you, you, you're fine. He, he's about to become a major character, a very major character, and he will dominate the last three books, or certainly two, in the way that Alfred did the first few. And he's an interesting character. He's a very interesting character, um, and a curious character. He never married. Thus didn't leave an heir, uh, which was most unusual for any medieval king. Um, and he's also exceedingly pious, much like his grandfather. Um, so yeah, he's gonna, I'm not, sure, I'm not gonna promise you that we get to Malmesbury. Um, but, but you're gonna get a lot of Athelstan, a lot. Including that at one point, one of the chronicles, and I, I mean, it, it, in, in one way it flies against almost everything we know about Athelstan, um, is that he wore his hair in ringlets that were bound in gold. I didn't say it, it was a helpful reader. Yes, Christian here. Hello. Um, when you write your next sharp novel, um, would you be willing to risk Judy's wrath and kill off the boy who lived, Midshipman Collier? <laughs> you, you know, if I say that and I get divorced, are you going to pay the fees? <laughs> Uh, the background of this is, is that um, I think it was in Sharp's Gold. I introduce a, an apple-cheeked little midshipman who has to operate the, the um, semaphore system. And it operated with ropes to, to move these like old-fashioned railway signals. And so they used sailors to do it. So this midshipman is there. And he's a frightfully nice little boy. He's a good boy scout. And he's awfully keen and he's polite. And, and he's a terrifically nice little chap. I mean, so nice that I blew his head off with a French cannonball. <laughs> and um, somebody at HarperCollins said, oh, that's terrible. He was such a nice boy. You can't do that. I thought, right. So every subsequent book, on comes this lovely little English chappy, aged 12. He's a terrific little guy, and the little bastard's going to die now. <laughs> um, and so sure enough, there is Midshipman Collier in Sharp's Trafalgar, which is one of my favorite Sharps. And uh, with great glee, um, I have Midshipman Collier boarding, I can't remember which French ship it was. Uh, and he's awfully nice. He's an enthusiastic little chap. Um, anyone would be proud to have fathered Midshipman Collier. And I get a Frenchman to run him through with a boarding pike. And, uh, and he's stuck to the mainmast. So I always give the um, first draft of the book to Judy to read. And she's, she's terrifically um, loyal, and, and she actually reads it, although, you know, she's a, a pacifist, Episcopalian, vegetarian yoga teacher. <laughs> and, and for the first time, she said, I don't want to read it. I said, well, she said, I know that you killed a small boy in it. I said, give it back. So I went back, and I let the little bastard live. <laughs> And he's still all perky and apple-cheeked and nice at the end. And then I wrote another book, and I put him in it, and I thought, okay, you're getting it this time, kid. And I thought, nah, he's under the protection of St. Judy. <laughs> and so he's still alive. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I have to keep faith. Um, but, but I promise you that if there is another sharp book, some small boy is going <laughs> to well, you're fantastic questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernard. Um, Bernard will be signing books just out in the corridor. You don't, there's a Waterstones just out there, so you don't need to go very far. Please do go and carry on the conversation out there. You say that your aim in your books is to entertain, and you have certainly spent a lovely, entertaining hour with us. Thank you so much. Bernard Cornwell. Thank Paul you. Well.